Good morning, saints. Good to have you with us today. And uh, God is on the throne. Um, I woke up from a dream this morning uh, thinking of a song, He Reigns. And uh, I won't go into the details of the dream, but it was exciting waking up to that thought that He reigns. And no matter what we're going through and the situations we're in, we can declare He reigns. He sits on the throne. And in despite what happens, he still reigns. Hallelujah. And that's that's great news. That's not just good news. That's great news that God still is reigning and ruling regardless of what men may think, what sometimes we may think or situations try to tell us. God still reigns. Hallelujah. So we are in the book of Daniel and uh, we are on chapter two. If you would like to turn there in our Bible study, we are on page five, I believe, uh, and we are looking to go on to um, question number eight. So as you turn there and prepare for our, our time of Bible study, uh, this is an amazing time that we live in, folks. Just think, we could have been born in any time frame, and God chose for us to be born here and now in this place, and how important that is for us. Thank you, Lord. And so as we get into our study, I want to give my wife an opportunity. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, you know, if there's anything you want to share right now or you want to wait until we get into this. Uh, what I just thought of when um, you were s saying that was uh, what an opportunity we live in and that God wants us to um, take a hold of. And he wants to open the word to us and uncover things and show us things that we've never seen before and um, reveal things to us like never before. But it, it, it's really going to take, um, we've been talking over and over about choice. It's, it's going to take a choice of us choosing daily, you know, even to get into the word. And so this is good what we're doing because we're choosing today to get into the word. And um, it's it's always, always, always a choice. And so either we choose life and the spirit or we choose flesh and death. And and um, so, you know, in the, in the very beginning, we need to, um, of our days is, is start by, uh, setting your mind on on God and you know one of the easiest ways I've found is I I pray the Lord's Prayer you know hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done and so that sets my course and it starts my mind thinking it but I need to bring my spirit and my heart into it too and, and not just let it stay in, in the mind you know the he wants us to move from the mind and from the flesh into into the spirit more and more. And that's what being um, alive in the kingdom and walking in the kingdom, doing his things, because the kingdom isn't limited to physical stuff. And that's what God was trying to tell us when, you know, Jesus came, is I'm, I'm opening up this bridge now through the Holy Spirit where you can start walking in the kingdom. And it's not... Um, physical things it's spiritual things it's righteousness peace and joy and that's what why those are listed as um, things in the kingdom you don't see it's finances it's not weapons it's not you know physical things that we we've see all the time so that's something that we go to and God is saying no I am bringing Jesus up uh, through bringing Jesus and when he goes I'm going to let the Holy Spirit come and through the Holy Spirit you're going to have access to these things that are will affect the physical if you will um, let yourself be open to me so that I can show them to you and to work through that so that you will see things change in your physical realm as you follow the Spirit and um, you know that's been more and more uh, evident to me is that he is calling us not to go by our minds and what we think, but to really turn to him and say, okay, 
you provided my teacher. He's with me right now. The Holy Spirit's with me right now. So I'm turning to you, Lord. I'm asking you for your wisdom, your understanding, your help in this. And he's going to reveal more and more to us as we walk and we choose him <laughs> from the very beginning. You know, it's not, oh, okay, during the middle of the day when something goes wrong, oh, now, Lord, I need you. <laughs> if you're, if you're, setting your course and choosing him from the very beginning, it's going to be easy to just um, latch on to him and have him help you during the day. So Amen. that's what we're doing. <laughs> you know, one of the things Dawn said was is that she starts the day off with praying the Lord's Prayer. And what a great prayer. I mean, Jesus taught his disciples. They asked him, how do we pray? And he, and he said, here's what to pray. I I would say that if Jesus, the Son of God, who knows the heart of God and reveals the heart of God and the things that he says, he says only as he hears the Father say these things and does the things that the Father does, it's pretty important for us to, to know the Lord's Prayer and really allow it to become an application in our life. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and, and, and the rest of it. And how important that is for us to, to go back to that um, God-centered prayer, um, talking to God. And uh, I read a scripture yesterday when Don and I were reading the Bible, and this was Proverbs twenty two twenty eight, And it says, Do not move the ancient boundary which your fathers have set. And I think it's important for us, uh, you know, anybody that's a landowner, uh, we have uh, survey stakes or pins or rocks or maybe years ago trees were planted in a certain area and uh, people would say that rock right there all the way to that rock over there is my property line. And, uh, you know, um, people would try to move those boundaries. Um, they would try to move the, the, the physical indicators. They would try to move it over and and basically it says, do not move the ancient boundaries um, that your fathers have set. And in a sense, our fathers, our spiritual fathers, established boundaries of how we are to live in the world today. And it's important for us as God's people uh, to, to sometimes be very careful about uh, fads or new teachings or... Uh, new teachers to come along and, and try to move the ancient boundaries. Say, well, that's not important. You don't need to worry about it. Here, this is the new thing. And, and as God's people, what we have to recognize is that, is that God has established um, in his kingdom boundaries that we are to live by. And the only way that we can find those boundaries <laughs> is by reading the word of God. And the things that we hear, the things that people tell us that they want us to think on, <coughs> do they line up with the word? Uh, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, prove all things. And the way we prove things is, is we compare them. So what's our standard of comparison? If, if I say a foot is this big and somebody could say, well, wait a minute, let me check that out. And no, you're off. It's it, a foot is this big, you know. How do they do that? They, they pull out a ruler, something that is very specific. They pull that out and say, no, this is a foot, not this. And uh, we have to be careful that whenever anybody comes spiritually and says, well, this is what a spiritual foot looks like. Now I'm using that as an example. But, but we, we take that and say, well, wait, that just doesn't sound right. According to the word, we're supposed to live this way. And, and this is the spiritual foot, this, this distance. And uh, we've got to be very careful um, how, we, how we monitor uh, what's happening in our lives, our thought life, um, uh, our children, our grandchildren. We have a responsibility to make sure that there's a an ancient boundary, biblical boundary that we've established that is immovable in the way we think, the way that we act, our attitudes and our thought life. And uh, it's important for us. That's why we're doing this study is to help you be exposed to the word of God. And listen, folks, anything that Don and I say, if it doesn't chime through, 
uh, or chime <coughs> true, compare it to the Word of God and say, ah, they're off in this area. I, I pray we, we aren't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we try to make sure that things match up with the Word of God. But you, we should do that with anybody we listen to, is prove all things. Let me pull out the spiritual ruler. Let me see if what they're saying is accurate according to the Word of God and how important it is for us to be a people who know the Word, spend time in the Word, um, digesting the Word, so to speak, so that when uh, things come up, we can challenge it and say, no, that's not according to what God wants. And uh, uh, if you're a parent or a grandparent, uh, I challenge you. Now, I don't challenge you. I, I exhort you. Let me put it that way. I exhort you to be very careful and selective about what your kids view, what games they play, um, what sites they go to uh, in, in uh, the media world that's out there. Let me tell you, there's some really bad stuff out there that we don't want our kids to get into. Uh, how important it is to be, a, to be people who can uh, make sure that our kids are getting a healthy diet of spiritual food, of mental food, that we're not letting them eat junk food, so to speak. I mean, what parent would let their kids eat candy bars all the time? Um, the, the eventuality is probably their kids would be pulled out of the home because of child abuse. And yet, do we do that mentally with our kids, letting them eat um, junk food uh, with what they watch, what they, they interact and play with on their games and things like that. How important it is for us to make sure that we establish the ancient boundaries in their lives where they can grow in understanding to the point where they can say, no, I don't want to do that. That's, I'm, I'm to, that's something I don't want to watch when they're with their friends and their friends. Ah, it's okay. We can watch. No, I don't want to watch that. That, that is a place of growth in a child's life when they can stand up and say, nope, I don't want that. I just flashed on <laughs> one reason. We're talking about this because I had had a dream um, to last this morning, last uh -huh, night. You did pull it in. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not going to tell about the dream. But anyway, what I, I just flashed on right now was light bulb, light bulb moment, <laughs> was that our eyes are the window to the soul. And so, you know, it's it's going to the spirit, too, more than um, what we think about. Think about what we dwell on will we'll go into the spirit, too. But when, when children are being reared and raised, that is more of an impact and gets in quicker is what they see because it's, it's going straight to your soul and your spirit. So you need to guard that. And so we have to be even extra more vigilant with what we're watching as well as protecting our children from that because it is such easy access and we don't realize the access that it is because they can't they can't all read. You know, mm. some of these little kids, um, I was told... But they can see. Yeah. And so seeing is a, is, is a very... A huge part uh, of the perception of things, what we see. When I was, when we were raising our kids, they said the the first most foundational and important times for them um, that really set things up in their life is from one to five, and that what you allow to get in, you know, when you're teaching them, you're talking to them, what you're showing them, and they took they told us don't let your kids during that age see violence on TV mm -hmm. because it is going to affect them whether they know what's going on or not. It's going to be an, an open door to things that will go it, it go into them. And um, that's something that is um, very important is what we're seeing. And God is wanting to develop the the sight in the spirit and not just the physical sight and the things that are are we were able to get right into um, from easy access you know you see these things and and the deception that is brought in because now they can change pictures and make things seem there's an illusion 
that is given that makes things seem real when they're not. And that that has been a, a, a trap of the enemy where he's tried to get in and he has gotten in because he can fool us into thinking something is real when it's not. And, you know, um, that's how he gets in with fear. The acronym for fear we have is false evidence appearing real. And so these are things that we need to guard against and see them as boundaries that we need to make sure are set and in place and um, not an open gateway or a door. Amen. <laughs> this was going... I let's let's get into our day. study. Again, page five, <laughs> greater than gold, book of Daniel. And uh, we are on question number eight, um, and we've we've just uh, finished up looking at the description that Daniel gives to King Nebuchadnezzar about his dream and seeing the statue. And uh, there was discussion we had about the the statue and the different empires. Um, it's interesting to me that Daniel interpreted a dream from a heathen king of what was to take place down through the centuries of the different empires that were established. And uh, so we talked about that uh, this last time around. Most Bibles have kind of a, a heading for each description, the gold being Nebuchadnezzar, and uh, then they, they were able to uh, go down to... Um, the silver, which is the Medo-Persian and Greek uh, empire, and uh, the iron, which was the Roman empire, and then all the way down to where we see a mixture of, of um, basically clay and iron, which is <coughs> the, the mixture of civilizations and cultures that were blended together, and yet they weren't able to adhere to one another. And uh, we see kingdoms that rise, rose and fell because of uh, the marrying of different countries together, trying to form an alliance, and yet there was a falling out. And we see that in history. Uh, you know, several hundred years ago, we saw quite a bit of that going on, where there was a contrivance by man to try and make a kingdom by, by having the daughters and sons marry so that they would join those kingdoms together. But Evidently, we see through history, they fell apart. Their alliances fell short many times, and uh, they they pulled apart from each other. So anyways, uh, we get to this point where we're talking about um, uh, basically the the last days and the discussion of the the rock that comes and crushes all of this statue, all of these kingdoms, and then evidently sets itself up. And uh, that basically that rock is Jesus Christ. He is, he is the rock. And uh, so uh, question number eight says, uh, how does the Bible describe Jesus entering into the last act of the play? And so in Revelations 19, 11, it says, and I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called I love this, faithful and true. Isn't it good that Jesus is faithful and true? And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. Uh, I want to read on from this because I think there's some pretty cool things. His eyes are a flame of fire. And uh, we look at that and we go, wow, flames shooting out from his eyes. Well, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever had your grade school teacher stare at you <laughs> and, and basically strip away all of this stuff in your life? Johnny, Susie, did you do this? Maybe your parents said it to you. You know what it's like to have a flame of fire coming out of the eyes of somebody in authority. Well, Jesus is going to be able to do that with all mankind uh, with just his stare, his gaze. Uh, and basically it says here, uh, his eyes are a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. 
He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called, and I love this, the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. And when we take time to read the Word of God, we are studying Jesus. Hallelujah. He is the Word of God. The uh, Bible tells us in John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And how important it is for us to realize that reading the Word is reading Jesus. It's establishing the ancient boundaries in everything we think and we do and, and our considerations. And so basically, the answer to that question is, uh, the heavens open and Jesus is on a white horse. He's called faithful and true and in righteousness. In other words, right standing, what is right, he judges and wages war. Jesus is a warrior and he's coming to wage war against the rebellion of this world. Think about that. Hallelujah. We serve an, an amazing almighty God. And there's nobody that can withstand him. I, I don't see this being a wrestling match whatsoever. He comes and he slays the enemy, uh, the beast and the false prophet talked about later on in, in this chapter, Revelations 19. They're cast into the lake of fire. And uh, the, Satan is bound for a thousand years. And there is a millennial reign of Christ here on this earth for a thousand years. We have yet to move into that, folks but that day is coming soon. Hallelujah. Next one. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, nine says, what will the stone do to the image? i got to go back. I was in Revelation. Verse 34, yeah. Yeah, Daniel 2, 34. Okay. Uh, let's see. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. So it um, it crushed, it struck the statue on its feet and crushed them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, notice that the stone was cut out without men's hands. That's right. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. There's something there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it is yet, but... Well. <laughs> We'll get into that. Okay. Uh, chapter, or excuse me, question number 10. How are idols made? Well, in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 4, verse 28, it says that they're the work of man's hands. And uh, basically idols, when you think about all the idols that have ever been made, if you've ever been to another country and people go into these temples and worship uh, their gods, all of their gods are made by their hands, and they worship the work of their hand, their handmade idols. And uh, yet what we see here is that this rock was formed without human hands. And we can, again, the rock is Jesus. We can go back to Jesus's birth. His birth was different than any other birth throughout the history of man. And it was a birth born of God. It was a virgin birth. And it's important for us to recognize that because that's one of the signs that Isaiah gives. This will be a sign unto you that a virgin will give birth and his name, and it goes into wonderful counselor, um, everlasting God, father, prince of peace. Mm -hmm. And, and it's important for us to recognize that the salvation that you and I walk in isn't of human contrivance. It isn't something man-made. And there are a lot of people out there saying, well, Christianity is just a man-made religion to keep everybody in control. Are you kidding me? What religion in the world says, um, you're not good enough, and so God came down, took your place, paid the price, and the penalty was death. What other religion says that? If anything, every other religion says, you can work your way up. You can become a god. You can be um, 
one with everything around you and and there's there's this working up this there's this human contrivance to improve our life to be better uh, and yet what we have to realize is that man is without excuse we're sinners there's no hope for us outside of Jesus Christ he is the way the truth and the life and I won't, won't get on my soapbox and preach. But what we have to realize is that God knew there was no way that you and I could become right standing with him. And so he, in an essence, bankrupt heaven by causing Jesus to be born of a virgin, fully man, fully God, perfect, sinless, he was without blemish and became, in essence, the sacrificial lamb that paid the price for our sin, which was death. And he fully paid it for all of mankind. Our responsibility is to accept that payment and recognize that Jesus died just for me, just for you. And that rock that comes and destroys all the kingdoms of the world is the rock Jesus Christ, who is not man-made that it was God made, that God was the one that desired that no man should perish, but all would come to repentance. Uh, John chapter 1 verse tells, uh, 12 tells us, um, to as many as receive him, he gave the right to become children of God, not born of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but the will of God. It was God's choice. It was God's will that we could have citizenship, in a sense, an inheritance um, to be adopted into this godly family. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? Uh, there's nothing that you and I can do that convinces God says, well, they're pretty good. Yeah, I'll let them in. No, there's none of that. It's it, God saying, I love you so much. And I know there's no way that you can pay the price, so I'll take care of the price. I will, I will help you to come to the place where you can be my child. Isn't that an awesome thing, folks? It sets us free from that sense of uh, guilt of, I got to work my way in. I've got to do these things because I got to impress God that I'm good enough. It, it, all of that is dismissed where we're just free to love God and grow in a loving relationship and do the things we do when God says, hey, I, I don't want you to do that. I want you to do this. And we go, God, I want to do those things that you want me to do. I, I don't want to do the things that you don't want me to do. And it becomes a love relationship and motivation. My wife and I have a love relationship with each other in the bonds of marriage. And we've made a covenant agreement. We choose to love each other. And because of that choice of love, there's things we do that encourage each other. We nurture our relationship in love. It isn't Dawn threatening me with a frying pan above my head, and it's not me strong-arming her, you will love me. It's, it's, it's a drawing, it's a wooing to where we do the things we do for each other because we love each other, because we want to please each other. That's the same kind of relationship, but a much greater capacity that God wants to have with us, where where he draws us in love, where he woos us in love, where the things we do, we want to do. I've, I've talked to many people over the years that, that um, have come to know Jesus Christ, and suddenly their language changes. They no longer talk with curse words. They no longer talk in rough ways. And then as we're talking, as I'm helping them to learn the Bible, um, they'll get excited and they'll blurt out something that, that's a curse word. And they'll go, oh, sorry about that. And I've never said a word to them about changing their language. It's something within them, a desire to want to do the right thing. And that's the work of God in our lives, wanting us to do the right thing. How wonderful that is. Mm -hmm. Ready to go on? Yeah, we, we're almost out of time. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get very far. That's okay. We did covered some questions. Uh, let's take a look at question 11. Okay. After the image was smitten, what did the stone become? Verse 35 says, then the iron and cl the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from those summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. 
So the um, stone became like chaff, mm -hmm. which is what, like dust or oh, yeah. smashed? Or well, when you, when you consider uh, the, the threshing method back at that time is they would take the grain, they would throw it into the threshing floor, and they would crush the, the seed so it would come out of the seed pods. I mean, if you've ever seen a um, wheat, you know, it, it looks like a stalk of grass, uh, much taller, and, it, and there's seed pods on the end. Well, it's the kernel inside that is the wheat, and so you have to separate that kernel from the, the pod that covers that wheat. And so what they would do is they would take it into the threshing floor and um, many times tread it out, uh, a lot of times what they do is they, they break it so that the, the seed pods and the seed come off of the stalks. They remove the stalks. And then what they do is, is they would throw the, the uh, seed pods and seeds up in the air and let the wind blow away the, the light stuff, the, the, chaff. the chaff. And the heavy stuff, which was the seed, would fall back down to the ground. And and so um, we don't see that much today because we have mechanical threshers that, that do all of that. But if you've ever seen pictures, there's people with these big, big round things and they have all of this stuff mixed in and they'll throw it up in the air and catch it again. And they let the, they do it on windy days. They let the the, the light stuff get blown off and then pretty soon all you see is just the seed falling back into the, the basket. And uh, that's, the, that's the illustration that they're giving there is that uh, this great statue, these great kingdoms will all be crushed and become like that, that stuff that isn't weighty anymore. It's just, it's like dust and it blows away with the air. And and isn't it interesting that, that nations and kingdoms rise and fall and the only kingdom of substance is the kingdom of God? The eventuality and, and the end game is, is that all the kingdoms of the world that were made to be, and they're made out of heavy things, gold, silver, iron. Um, and we see there uh, basically the, the iron and the clay mixed together. Uh, what we see here is, let me go back here and make sure I covered all the metals there. Uh, let's see. Bronze. I thought bronze. there was another one in there. Um, so we see, we see gold, silver, bronze, iron, and iron mixed with clay. Those are all heavy things. Uh, they're substantial. And uh, gold being one of the heaviest metals and silver being after that and bronze being very heavy and iron, uh, how heavy that is. And, and uh, clay, uh, you know, clay is much heavier than dirt because it's so compacted. And, and these metals of substantiality are eventually destroyed by a rock made without hands that, and it destroys them and causes them to become like chaff, worthless, uh, light, um, of no substance. And that is God's kingdom through Jesus Christ. What a wonderful um, picture that, that God gives us through this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. Now, when you think about this, Nebuchadnezzar was a ruler over all of the known world at that time. His kingdom was weighty. Matter of fact, Daniel called him and said, you're the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And, uh, and I had a hard time with that, but, but realize is that that was the um, perception that Daniel had of, of this king. He had much influence worldwide at that time. And yet his kingdom would eventually become like chaff and blow away. How important it is for us as God's people to recognize that the kingdom that we serve and the kingdom that we live in is a substantial kingdom. And even though there are people around us that would try to make light of it, there are people who who basically say it's nothing, it's it's weightless. It's uh, the eventuality is is that every one of those people will come to. Uh, a realization, some fortunately and some unfortunately, will come to the realization 
that just as the scriptures say, at the name of Jesus, every mm-hmm. knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord over everything. That rock that crushes all the kingdoms of the world. Isn't it a wonderful privilege that you and I get to declare, he reigns, even as I mentioned at the beginning about the dream I had. You know, he reigns in every situation that comes along in our life that tries to say, does God reign? We can declare, yes, God reigns, he reigns. Even in this crummy situation that I find myself in, even in this physical malaise, uh, maybe just feeling weak and, and, and worthless, um, even in our infirmities, uh, a bad cold, um, COVID, um, maybe you're dealing with cancer, maybe you're dealing with, with uh, arthritis, that even in this, God, you reign, that it, it, it's all going to fade away, folks. Our bodies are going to be set aside and, and we're given new bodies. Uh, our thinking is going to have a revelatory change instantaneously where where every thought is brought literally captive to the obedience of Christ in that great day. Uh, I, I tell you, I read the uh, rest of chapter 19 of Revelations and got really excited, so excited that I went into chapter 20. Whew, man, I'm telling you, there's some wonderful things for the people of God, the, the, the kingdom of Jesus Christ and as, of his Father that we can look forward to. So regardless of what you're going through, regardless of what you're dealing with, he reigns, Jesus reigns, hallelujah. Any closing thoughts? No, you got it. Huh? No, you got it. I got it? Okay. Well, let's pray, Don. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we are amazed at your goodness. We're amazed at your love for us. We're amazed at your forgiveness. We're amazed at the provision that you've given to us through Jesus Christ. What a wonderful privilege it is to call you Father God. What a wonderful privilege it is that that we of our own free will, we can say, Jesus, you reign. Father God, you reign. Holy Spirit, you reign and that we're not under compulsion from anything but love and admiration for you, that we can declare that. We pray for our brothers and sisters. Lord, uh, help them to get through this day and the rest of this week. Um, Lord, um, I pray that you would just put in their spirit uh, the greatness of your kingdom. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you, folks. We'll see you tonight. Pastor David and I will be back at 7 o'clock and uh, go into our continuing study in the book of Romans. God bless you.